Ah, uh, gosh, I guess we can talk about Elon Musk's shadow rule, this new article for The New Yorker. This is an article by Rowan Farrow, and he talks to a lot of the people around Elon Musk in the pursuance of this article, which I thought was a, was a unique way to approach this. And he said this on CNN. He said on CNN that Elon Musk has already put out a deluge of information about himself on the internet through his constant stream of consciousness. Some of it interesting, some of it uninteresting, some of it we wish we didn't know. Either way, we have a lot of information about Elon Musk, or at least a lot of information about what Elon Musk allows us to know, right? Um, unless we uncover it through other means. What we don't usually know is how the people immediately surrounding Elon Musk and the people who have to work with Elon Musk, either because they chose to or because Elon Musk kind of fell into their lap and they have to work to, with each other due to circumstance, how they view him. And this whole piece is fantastic. It talks about his domination of the space sector and uh and how the fact that the, the the fact that the american government has to get through him in order to go to space his domination of electric charging stations across the country with him controlling 60 percent of the nation's charging stations and the unprecedented power and influence that gives him um and that's not the only sectors there's a few others as well but the area we're going to concentrate on today and of course this is the area we're going to concentrate on today because we're nerds about foreign policy is specifically starlink in the war in ukraine starlink in the war in ukraine now this is the first time that i've talked about elon musk starlink in the war in ukraine uh, many of you might remember that i released a piece on my main channel dylan burns tv that you can go check out where I uh, uh, took footage of people delivering Starlink to frontline soldiers in Ukraine and used it as a narrative device to talk about Elon Musk, his influence on the war, how at the start he was very supportive. And when Ukraine made that call for support, he sent out Starlink. He said it would be on his own dime. He said he would never cut services. Then he then he cut services. Then he started to reverse. And Ian Bremmer said at the time, and Elon Musk denied this, Ian Bremmer said at the time that the reason we were seeing this reversal from Elon Musk and we saw him making proposals saying Crimea is part of Russia and how most of the East wants to be part of Russia, and he was saying all this wild stuff, that that actually had to do with the fact that he was having private calls with Vladimir Putin and that dude was schmoozing him. And that Elon Musk had gotten it in his head that by him allowing Starlink to operate on the front line, he was provoking them in some way. And so he started to cut services, which had a deadly impact on the front. This article reinforces that, and it reinforces that idea solidly with multiple credible officials now repeating the line that was originally said by Ian Bremmer more than a year ago. And this, in my opinion, raises... The profile, not really raises the profile of Ian Bremmer. He's already a pretty accomplished person, but I think raises the credibility of Ian Bremmer when he makes uh, accusations like this in the future. It seems like all of the evidence is reinforcing that idea. Let's read the start of this article because this is a wild culmination of facts. Last October, Colin Cowell, then the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy at the Pentagon, sat in a hotel in Paris and prepared to make a call to avert disaster in Ukraine. A staffer had handed him an iPhone, in part to avoid inviting an onslaught of late-night texts and colorful emojis on Call's own phone. Call had returned to his room with its heavy uh, uh, with its distant view of the Eiffel Tower after a day of meeting with officials in the United Kingdom, France, and Germany. A senior defense official told me that he was surprised by whom he was about to contact. He was like, why am I calling Elon Musk? The reason soon became apparent. Even though Musk is not technically a diplomat or statesman, I felt it was important to treat him as such given the influence that he had on this issue. Kyle told me, I'm oh, sorry, Kyle told me, I did. Yeah, should have ended it there. SpaceX, Musk's space exploration company, had for months been providing internet access across Ukraine, allowing the country's forces to plan attacks and to defend themselves. But in recent days, the forces had found their connectivity severed as they entered territory contested by Russia. More alarmingly, SpaceX had recently given the Pentagon an ultimatum. If it didn't assume the cost of providing service in Ukraine, which the company calculated at some $400 million annually, it would cut off access. Now, I just do want to remind people that 
that Star SpaceX and Elon went out of their way after it was requested by the Ukrainian government to provide them support, say they would cover the costs, and then say they wouldn't cut it. Before later, of course, cutting it. I just want I just want to put that out there that they went out and offered the support. And then when Ukraine's infrastructure and military structure and everything was high reliant, highly reliant on Starlink. And I can say that a lot of people are highly reliant on Starlink, whether it be hospitals, whether it be frontline soldiers or daily civilians trying to go about their work week. They are all highly reliant on Starlink in many different ways. And I can say that as somebody who's, you know documented the process of Starlink deliveries that not only are people relying on Starlink, but people have risked their lives in order to deliver Starlink to where it is needed. It is not the only internet infrastructure in Ukraine. I don't use Starlink, for example. I, I use a more traditional uh, Ukrainian internet provider. But it is extremely helpful for people in isolated situations, like soldiers often are. We started to get a little panicked, the senior defense official said, one of the four who described the standoff to me. Musk could turn it off at any given moment, and that would have a real operational impact for the Ukrainians. Musk had become involved in the war in Ukraine soon after the Russians invaded in February of 2022. Along with conventional assaults, the Kremlin was conducting cyber attacks against Ukraine's digital infrastructure. Ukrainian officials and a loose coalition of expatriates in the tech sector brainstorming in group chats on WhatsApp and Signal, found a potential solution. SpaceX, which manufactures a line of mobile internet terminals called Starlink. The tripod-mounted dishes, each about the size of a computer display and clad in white plastic reminiscence of sleek design sensibility, uh, the sleek design sensibility of Musk's Tesla electric cars, connected with a network of satellites. Each of these disks are about the size of a pizza box. The units have limited range, but in this situation, that was an advantage. Although a nationwide network of dishes was required, it would be difficult for Russia to completely dismantle Ukrainian connectivity. Of course, Musk could do so. Three people involved in bringing Starlink to Ukraine, all of whom spoke on the condition of anonymity because they are worried that Musk, if upset, could withdraw his services, told me that they originally overlooked the significance of his personal control. Nobody thought about it back then, one of them, a Ukrainian tech executive, told me. It was all about, let's fucking go, people are dying. I mean, this agreement was made about 48 hours to like 100 hours into the war's start. There was not a lot of time to talk about contract details and long-term sustainability and if Elon Musk is a particularly fickle or unfickle person, or if he was going to play foreign policy expert. There wasn't enough time for that. The Russians were marching on Kiev. All hands were on deck. So anybody offering support, the Ukrainians were willing to take it. In the ensuing months, fundraising in Silicon Valley's Ukrainian community, contracts with the U.S. Agency for International Development, and with European governments, and pro, con pro bono contributions from SpaceX facilitated the transfer of thousands of Starlinks to Ukraine. A soldier in Ukraine Signal Corps, who is responsible for maintaining Starlink access across the front line, who asked to be identified only by his first name, Mikola, told me, it's the essential backbone of communication on the battlefield. Initially, Musk showed unreserved support for the Ukrainian cause, responding encouragingly, as Fedorov, the Ukrainian Minister for Digital Transformation, tweeted pictures of equipment in the field. But as the war ground on, SpaceX began to bulk at the cost. We are not in a position to further donate terminals to Ukraine or fund the existing terminals for an indefinite period of time, SpaceX Director of Government Sales told the Pentagon in a letter last September. CNBC recently valued SpaceX at nearly $150 billion, Forbes estimated Musk's personal net worth at $220 billion, making him the world's richest man. That's the thing that I am a little sick of hearing. I'm a little sick of hearing that SpaceX can't bear the cost or Elon Musk can't bear the cost. They 100% can bear the cost. They 100% can bear the cost. In fact, they can bear the cost and as a percentage of their own wealth, they wouldn't even lose that particularly much when most Americans can't afford, afford much more than a $400 emergency. I don't think the richest man on the planet 
deciding to support a nation that is now victim to the largest invasion of Europe since World War II um, is something to, you know, balk at. It's, it's, an, it's an achievement, but you can't really, you know, claim responsibility or get bragging rights for it if you pull out halfway through. Musk was also growing increasingly uneasy with the fact that his technology was being used for warfare. You know, people joke about the Oppenheimer Le Bomb thing, like, my Le Bomb was used to kill Le People? Oh no. And I think people are kind of, you know, misrepresenting, uh, misrepresenting Oppenheimer. I think it was, you know, Opp Oppenheimer knew what it was that it was going to be used for war. Uh, it was, it was somebody who I, I think, I, I think people kind of exaggerate exactly how like shocked he was. Elon Musk, a little less so. I think Elon Musk actually fits that kind of stereotype of Oppenheimer in the nuke a little bit more. You were giving it to the Ukrainians knowing that they were going to most likely use it for, for internet infrastructure for not only their civilian sector, but also the military sector. And he knew since the early days of the war that they were using it for the military. It's not like he's, he can't access a lot of the data behind these satellites. So it's like, it's, this is something we could have brought up in March, 2022, maybe April. Anyway, continuing. That month, at a conference in Aspen, attended by business and political figures, Musk even appeared to express support for Vladimir Putin. He was on stage and he said, We should be negotiating. Putin wants peace. We should begin negotiating peace with Putin. The question is, what type of peace? Because if the type of peace is annexing large swaths of territory, that's not really peace for the people who are still there. That's just peace for Putin. Reed Hoffman, who helped start PayPal with Musk, recalled, Musk seemed, he said, to have bought what Putin was selling, hook, line, and sinker. That's concerning that people, and, the, and see, this is the stuff that's interesting. When you talk to, his, the, the, to the people in Musk's inner circle, the people who know Musk, the people who have known Musk for years, you get these types of insights, insights that I haven't seen about the man before. And... I mean, the Ian Bremmer stuff has been up for speculation for so long on whether you trust Ian Bremmer's assessment of him talking to Putin or not. It feels like we could have figured this out a lot sooner. A, lot sooner. <laughs> a week later, Musk tweeted a proposal for his own peace plan, which called for new referendums to redraw the borders of Ukraine and granted Russia control of Crimea, the semi-autonomous peninsula recognized by most nations, including the United States, as Ukrainian territory and was illegally annexed by the Russians. In later tweets, Musk portrayed as inevitable an outcome, an outcome favoring Russia and attached maps highlighting Eastern Ukrainian territories, some of which he argued prefer Russia. Now there's no data uh, uh, that supports this. The only thing he used to prove this is that these provinces that he was talking about when he's talking about like Kharkiv, and he's talking about, you know, Donetsk and Luhansk, these provinces voted for Yanukovych in 2012. And so he uses that to say that they want to be part of Russia. That is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, if, if that's all you need to know, to know they want to be part of Russia, does that mean that if I got a candidate that was especially sympathetic with the Canadians, that means I want to be part of Canada? Somebody can vote for a candidate that is sympathetic towards the Russians and not want to be part of Russia. Someone could buy into like an idea of like, yeah, we have cultural ties with Russia and I think we should be friendly with the Russians and have a decent working relation or, or, or buy into any number of narratives and not also want to be Russian. But that is not something that Elon Musk even thought of when making this analysis. He just, I think he, he had his idea already kind of pre-constructed beforehand. And so he just was kind of looking for anything he could grab to support it. Uh, in later tweets, Musk, uh, here it is. Musk also polled his Twitter followers about the plan. Millions responded with about 60% rejecting the proposal. Uh, Musk responded to this, by the way, and he doesn't mention this in the article. And I don't know why, because it was quite funny. He responded by saying it was botted. I just want to put that out there. He didn't have any evidence it was botted. He just responded by saying it was botted. 
Um, at the time that this happened, I don't think he even had control of Twitter yet. So I don't even know how he would even have access to the information to find out if it was botted. By then, Musk's sympathies appeared to be manifesting on the battlefield. One day, Ukrainian forces advancing into contested areas in the south found themselves suddenly unable to communicate. We were very close to the front line, Mikolai, the single corpse soldier told me. We crossed the border and the Starlink stopped working. The consequences were immediate. Communications became dead. Units were isolated. When you're, when you're on offense, especially for commanders, you need a constant stream of information from battalions. Commanders had to drive to the battlefield to be in radio range, risking themselves. This is also the same way that a lot of Russian commanders were killed during the early days of the war. We need Elon now, uh, a Ukrainian military official told him. How now, he replied. Like fucking now, the official said. People are dying. Another Ukrainian involved told me that he was awoken by dozens of calls saying they'd lost connectivity and had to retreat. Had to retreat because they lost connectivity. The Financial Times reported that outages affected units in Kherson, Zaporozhye, Kharkiv, Donetsk, and Luhansk. Uh, if you want that in layman's terms, it affected units along the entirety of the front line. American and Ukrainian officials told me they believe that SpaceX had cut connectivity via geofencing, cordoning off areas of access. So basically, he cordoned off any area that the Russians believe that belongs to them in any way or that isn't contested in any way. So he cordoned off areas for support that are most needed and were like 80% of the reason why they wanted the support in the first place. The senior defense official said, we had a whole series of meetings internal to the, by the way, I just want to throw, uh, uh, you know what, no, I'll read a little bit more before I throw out my, my lambasting, okay? Because there's a little bit more that I think reveals a lot. The senior official def defense official told me, we had a whole series of meetings internal to the department to try to figure out what we could do about this. Musk's singular role presented unfamiliar, unfamiliar challenges, as did the government's role as an intermediary. It wasn't like we could hold him in breach of contract or something, the official continued. My main complaint in my video I released like six, seven, eight months ago now on Elon Musk in Ukraine was that we did not have solid contracts with SpaceX and with Elon to make it so that he would have to be held to the commitments to support Ukraine. So that if he changes tomorrow and, and he decides, now I'm a Nazbol because that's fashionable or whatever, and he wants to pull support, that he can't literally just choke the country dead when it comes to his communication infrastructure, which is what he was doing during that period when they were cutting support without any warning, mind you, he didn't give them a warning. Like I'm going to cut, I'm going to cut the communications tomorrow. At least if he did that, then nobody's life would have been put at risk. So because they could have prepared for it. I mean, still people could have been affected. People even still could have died, but their lives would have put, been put at less risk because they could have prepared, but no, he gave them no warning and then people died. But yeah, the, 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 the breach of contract and having a contract so you could hold him to his word was unbelievably important. Typically, such a negotiation would be handled by the Pentagon's acquaintances, uh, acquisitions department. But Musk had become more than just a vendor like Boeing, Lockheed, or other defense industry behemoths. On the phone with Musk from Paris, call was deferential. According to unclassified talking points for the call, he thanked Musk for his efforts in Ukraine, acknowledged the steep costs he's incurred, and pleaded for even a few weeks to devise a contract. If you cut this off, it doesn't end the war, call recalled telling Musk. Musk wasn't immediately convinced. My inference was that he was getting nervous that Starlink's involvement was increasingly seen in Russia as enabling the Ukrainian war effort and was looking for a way to placate Russian concerns. So Elon Musk's apparent default position right now is whatever the issue is, we have to compromise, whether it be on Ukrainian freedom, 
whether it be on Ukrainian sovereignty, whether it be on the Ukrainian economy, what resources they access, what people live under occupied rule, what people live under non-occupied rule, whether like like any and all like every single thing needs to be compromised on, even if even if it means a lower standard of living for the people on the ground, because you need to placate the Russians. And if you understand it through that framing, through his framing of the end is near, no victory can be achieved, just give the Russians what they want. If you understand it through that framing, then a lot of his actions make a lot more sense. Because he seems to be basically scared of the Russians. To the dismay of Ru Pentagon officials, Musk volunteered that he had spoken with Putin personally. Another individual told me that Musk had made the same assertion in the weeks before he tweeted his pro-Russia peace plan and had said that his consultations with the Kremlins were regular. Musk later denied having spoken with Putin about Ukraine. So he said that he spoke with Putin once and it was just about random Starlink stuff. It wasn't about Ukraine. Now it seems to be the case that Elon Musk was lying. He was lying about his communications. Ian Bremmer a year ago said this happened. He denied it then. But now we've got multiple sources in The New Yorker, including the former Undersecretary of State for the Pentagon, credible government officials. Yeah, no, he did that, and he just lied about it. Which I do want to throw out there how unbelievably crazy it is that Elon Musk went talked to the Russians, heard their talking points, and literally took them at face value. And that is what he did. He took Russian talking points at face value. You want to know how I took how I know he took Russian talking points with face value? Because he repeated them without even thinking about them. When he said something like, the majority of the Eastern Ukrainians before to be a part of Russia, and then cites 2012 election data to prove it. Election data that they didn't have on the ballot do you want to be part of Russia, but was about Yanukovych running for president. That's unbelievably dishonest. Somebody had to put that worm in his head that his election results showed that they wanted to be part of Russia. That is not what the data shows, but that's how he tried to cite the data. Could you imagine me citing like Barack Obama's overwhelming election in 2008 saying, Americans obviously want to be part of Canada. Do you know how, how pro-Canada Obama is? You know how much he loves Canada? It's silly. It's unbelievably silly. But that's what he did. He repeated Russian talking points word for word, bar for bar, that he most likely literally got from the Kremlin. So when we talk about repeating Kremlin talking points, Elon Musk took it to a whole other level. On the phone, Musk said that he was looking at his laptop and could see the entire war unfolding through a map of Starlink, Starlink activity. So it's not like he didn't know that the activity was falling apart and that people could die due to his actions, just throwing that out there. So what have we learned? That he re not only repeated rushing talking points word for word, but he got it directly from the Kremlin that he was directly communicating with Vladimir Putin and listening to his concerns and taking those concerns to propose peace plans that benefit them, peace plans based off of very inaccurate and very faulty data, and that he cut Starlink activity that led to the deaths of the Ukrainian soldiers who were fighting on the front line and led to multiple retreats. After he, he offered and came out and offered his equipment to the Ukrainians. This was like three minutes before he said, well, I had this great conversation with Putin, the senior defense official told me, and we were like, oh dear, this is not good. Musk told Call that the vivid illustration of how technology he had designed for peaceful ends was being used to wage a war gave him pause. Le bomb. I design le bomb in le bomb. Bomb le people. I don't understand. I don't understand. What did he think it was going to be used for when he sent it to a fucking war zone? I just, after a 15 minute call, Musk agreed to give the Pentagon more time. He also, after public back, 
blowback, he did get a lot of heat. And with evident, evident annoyance, walked back his threats to cut off the service. The hell with it, he tweeted. Even though Starlink is still using money and other companies are getting billions of taxpayer dollars, we'll just keep funding Ukraine government for free. This June, thank God for this, thank the Lord for this, by the way, the Department of Defense announced that it had reached a deal with SpaceX. On one hand, it's good because that means there's a contract, which means that Elon Musk can't decide, hmm, I feel like a Virgo today. How many Ukrainians are we going to let perish? Like, he can't do that if we, if, because we can hold him to his, to his standard. We can hold him to the contract, which was my main critique in my video when I covered Starlink and I covered Elon's influence on the war. So I'm happy the Pentagon has done something about it. On the other hand, giving Elon Musk money for, for how he behaved, it feels like rewarding the worst behavior. It really feels like rewarding the worst behavior. Anyway, what this, and there's a lot more to this article on Elon and it talks about his role on American society in a lot of other ways when it comes to things like AI, when it comes to things like electric charging stations and electric cars, space travel. And it shows just how much influence this one man who, you know, is pretty faulty. And I, and I, and I, and I say pretty faulty, but I think that the author of it, Ronan Farrow, put it best on CNN. He's very human. And putting this much power and influence in the arms of, in the hands of one human, unrestrained by any type of public inquiry, unrestrained by any type of like, we vote you out of power. Because he's unrestrained in that way and he's human and all humans make mistakes. Some humans are egotistical, some ego humans are jealous, some humans are braggadocious, who knows? Because he's human putting that much power in his hands might not be the smartest move, especially if he's deciding to undercut vital military communication infrastructure in the middle of, Amer of Ukrainian military operations that gets people killed with no warning. And because my military infrastructure is being used for le war, very, very, very startling article. And the worst case scenario that Ian Bremmer laid out seems to be true.